Hi everybody, good afternoon. I'm very glad to act as a moderator of this webinar on machine learning and cloud process parametrization for weather and climate models that will be given by Professor Christopher Bretterton from the University of Washington. Let me spend a few words to introduce myself and CMCC Foundation. I'm a full professor of computer engineering at the University of Salento, Department of Innovation Engineering, and also a member of the CMCC Strategic Council. Moreover, I'm the director of the CMCC Supercomputing Center in Lecce. Slide number two. The Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change is a non profit research institution established in 2005 with the financial support of the Ministry of Education, University, and Research, the Ministry of the Environment and Protection of Land and Sea, the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry Policies, and the Ministry of Finance, thanks to funding from a special research fund within the National Strategic Program for Research. CMCC deals with the investigation and modeling of our climate system and its interaction with the society and the environment. Our work is focused on sustainable growth, environment protection and science development through adaptation and mitigation policies based on reliable and timely scientific results. As you can see from slides uh, three, four, and five, CMCC is made up of nine research divisions spread throughout Italy. These divisions cover different research subjects, ranging from climate simulation and prediction to ocean modeling, scientific computing, and assessment of climate change impacts on our ecosystems. Slide number six. Finally, CMCC was established to act as a center of excellence on climate change in Italy, and it uh, represents both nationally and internationally an institutional point of reference for decision makers, institutions, as well as uh, public and private companies. Now, let me introduce our speaker. Christopher Bretterton is a professor at the Department of Science at the University of Washington. Chris is an atmospheric scientist who is actively involved in studies on cloud formation and turbulence and in the development of computer code for simulating cloud formation by atmospheric turbulence. This code is using the two leading US climate models. He was a lead author of the IPCC FIT assessment report in 2013. He was also the chair of the 2012 National Academy report on the National Strategy of Advanced Climate Modeling and former director of the University of Washington Program on Climate Change. He is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union that gave him the Jules Jul Charney Award in 2012. Slide number seven. Before handing over to Chris, I'd like to inform you that you can forward your questions to me during the presentation using the question menu available on the webinar system. I will then take care of passing them to him at the end of this talk. Okay, can people hear me? Please go ahead, Chris. You can yeah, start your presentation. Yeah. Oh, okay, um, so welcome from Seattle. This is Chris Bretherton. Um, as Giovanni said, I'm a professor of uh, atmospheric science and applied math uh, at the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, where it's uh, a lot earlier for me than it is for you. Uh, this is work that I've done jointly uh, with uh, a postdoc, uh, Noah Brunowitz, who in fact did most of this. And uh, I'd also like to thank Antonio Navarra, who uh, originally uh, invited me to give a webinar uh, for all of you. So what I'd like to talk about is uh, machine learning as applied to the parameterization, the representation of uh, cloud processes in weather and climate models. And First, I'd like to spend some time giving you an appreciation of the problem and an understanding of why machine learning is an attractive approach for this type of problem. Uh, so this is a geostationary satellite image. Um, you can see 
uh, Baja, California, and Mexico, um, uh, in the upper part of the center of the screen. And you can see many different types of clouds uh, in this picture. Uh, tropical convective clouds uh, lined along the, uh, the center um, in the intertropical convergent zone. You can see storm track clouds at the very north edge of the picture. Uh, you can see a lot of um, low-lying marine boundary layer clouds in the center of the picture. And an important feature that you really appreciate from pictures like this is that clouds are very multi-scale. They uh, are not just on global scales. They're not just on the scales of uh, turbulent processes, even though turbulent processes create clouds, but they're organized on all the scales in between. Uh, and this makes them a very challenging simulation problem for atmospheric models because no model can resolve all of the scales uh, relevant for cloud formation. For instance, we can look at a uh, photo uh, of the South China Sea. Um, so this shows a region corresponding to about 100 by 100 kilometers, uh, which is the size of a typical grid column of many global climate models. And what you can see within this picture is many different types of clouds. You can see some uh, small shallow cumulus clouds at the bottom. You can see some large cumulus congestus clouds up higher and cumulonimbus clouds with uh, cirrus anvils, um, even higher still. And the point is that within an individual grid box, you have all of this different cloud activity and variability. And in a traditional, parameterization of clouds in climate models, you have to represent all of this subgrid variability in terms of simple statistics like cloud fraction, radiation overlap, precipitation overlap, and the vertical, et cetera. And uh, we don't really know how to do this. There's no theory for how to do this. Um, so uh, we often use um, very oversimplified approaches to try to do this that don't work all that perfectly. In particular, uh, an issue with representing cloud processes is that there are many aspects of cloud processes. So for instance, uh, clouds are formed often from evaporation of water from the surface. Uh, so there's a, a surface interaction component. Um, turbulence, small-scale turbulence, brings that water up to the point where uh, it can condense into clouds. Uh, those clouds may then rise uh, freely on their own uh, in cumulus convection all the way through the depth of the troposphere. Um, during that time, they could be condensing liquid water, um, like ice. They could be precipitating it. And so these are many different parameterizations within a climate model. So in a typical climate model, all of these processes, turbulence, cumulus convection, cloud microphysics, surface processes, cloud fraction, they're all actually represented by separate subroutines within that model. So that's one issue. Another one is, of course, that we have to highly idealize the representation of some of those processes. So the picture on the right here shows a parameterization uh, of uh, shallow cumulus convection, i.e. cumulus con clouds that are not heavily precipitating and rise only into the lower part of the troposphere. And uh, the horizontal lines are the edges of uh, grid levels in the model. And the main point about this is, of course, we've had to highly idealize all of the processes that go into uh, the formation of these types of clouds and uh, represent them in very simple mathematical terms, which we know only capture some of what is really happening. So necessarily our parameterizations of many cloud processes are extremely oversimplified. They're developed by experts, uh, but they're very subjective. And as a result, especially when we put them together, they work quite imperfectly. And this then leads to biases in models. So for instance, one famous precipitation bias, which is 
almost certainly primarily related to cloud processes is the so-called double ITCZ rainfall bias, where uh, climate models, whose multi-model mean is shown on the left here, have a, uh, a single maximum in precipitation in the eastern and central Pacific, uh, while, um, oh, so that's the observations, while models then have much more of a so-called double ITCZ structure with two maxima in precipitation in the central and east Pacific. And uh, this bias uh, is something that some models have, with some effort, been able to uh, improve um, quite a bit, but um, it tends to be a natural consequence of the way that we parameterize cloud processes. In addition, something you can imagine is that when if you have a complicated set of parameterizations within a model for cloud processes, uh, you don't necessarily want to be changing the representation of any of those processes, such as cloud microphysics or, or cumulus convection, um, too fundamentally uh, too often, because it affects everything that the model does. And so the improvement of models like that comes through what we call tweaking, or, or, or um, just, just through very small changes more than from fundamental advances. Uh, and so uh, ECMWF is, is a very good example of how to use that to make an excellent model, but it takes uh, a lot of work and a lot of time. And there's no guarantee that when you're done that you, you have as good a representation of the clouds as you possibly could. Okay, so what could we do a bit differently? Well, I, I've worked on this problem personally for a long time. And one of the new features of the 21st century is uh, big science. We have big data. We have uh, enormous uh, resource of global satellite data on radiation, clouds, precipitation, surface characteristics, aerosols, sea ice, etc. Um, we also have the capability of doing high resolution global simulations uh, of weather and climate and for short periods of time or on regional grids, we can do even finer grid simulations of uh, a kilometer or less uh, for a few days globally, or even as little as 100 meters over, over Germany, which uh, MPI has done uh, for selected days um, in past. So we can run very high resolution models and those represent these processes I was talking about, these cloud processes much better. But the models that we have, which have a coarser resolution and don't resolve individual cumulus clouds, for instance, still do need parameterizations and those parameterizations need to be optimized. And the approach that we've been taking to that, the, of, of having experts design parameterizations, has not reduced the intermodal spread in climate sensitivity or regional precipitation trends, for instance. So, Although our models are clearly getting better, they're not converging on giving us better advice about the future. So a question then is, when we think about big data, especially, uh, we naturally think about machine learning uh, because machine learning requires big data sets. So the question is, can machine learning enable more accurate parameterizations? Can it enable us to make better use of the data that we have? And can it allow the use of ultra fine resolution process models that simulate clouds better without the need for many of the subgrid parameterizations of cloud variability that current climate models and weather prediction models have today? So uh, over the last few years, um, there have been a number of attempts to apply machine learning to weather and climate. And so these have covered a whole variety of different 
topics. One of them is automatic detection of extreme weather events and model output, and in some case, um, automatic um, uh, alerts to a decision maker, or say a meteorologist, that, that perhaps a model is predicting an extreme weather event in some particular area. Uh, another one is so-called emulation, so using a machine learning scheme to actually take an existing parameterization, for instance, for atmospheric radiation or convection, and speed it up by just learning its output over a large variety of cases and replacing that by uh, a machine learning approach such as a neural net. Um, another approach uh, application of machine learning is that uh, you know, any weather or climate model has a lot of adjustable parameters in it. and You'd like to automatically optimize those to give the best forecast, if you can decide what you mean by the best. Um, it's also uh, would be nice to be able to automatically learn from reanalysis or, or data. And there are approaches to how we can do that. The approach I'm going to talk about involves trying to make a parameterization for a coarse grid weather or climate model from simulations from a much finer grid model, which represents the cloud processes more accurately. But I want to stress that this is only one application of machine learning. I'm going to tell you about that because it's what it's one of the things we've been doing. We've actually been working on uh, the, a couple of these other topics as well. Um, and in particular, although there is a lot of really interesting recent work on this, um, in particular, I would recommend to you this paper by Raspidal. Um, I'm only going to tell you about our work because we only have a certain limited amount of time. So uh, just a couple of issues with machine learning. Um, machines are designed, or machine learning is designed to work with large amounts of data. People are design, People have evolved to learn how to extrapolate from a very small amount of data. Uh, so, so we're very good in, in taking one or two cases and making a decision. It may be faulty, but we can, we can make a decision on a couple of cases probably more reliably than almost any machine learning algorithm could do. But given enough cases, machines can do better than we can because we just can't train ourselves that accurately accurately we only would we sort of our brains are wired to make use of relatively limited data uh, in addition another issue with machine learning for climate in particular uh, a challenge that I don't think we've really solved is that you can't really take a machine learning algorithm and extrapolate it outside of its training regime and expect it to work well so in particular, if you trained a machine learning scheme entirely using present observations or simulations of present observations, that would not be good for a warmer climate. If we use models to train machine learning, we can train a high resolution model of a future climate and still use it to develop a coarse resolution parameterization of that future climate though. Okay, so now I'd like to talk about our uh, application. Um, so, the first point I want to make is that although processes such as cumulus convection are very challenging for weather and climate models because they're not resolved fully by the grids of such models, if we do resolve those uh, cumulus clouds and other cloud processes, we can get quite accurate simulation with present day process models called cloud resolving models. And this picture shows you an example called the Giga LES from Murat Kurudinov. Um, and it's a simulation of a 100 by 100 kilometer, in fact, I think a 200 by 200 kilometer region uh, of the tropical Atlantic using a, a grid that's 100 meters in each horizontal and the vertical direction. And uh, you can't, of course, quantitatively tell anything, but this, uh, rendering of the, the clouds at least shows that you have a very realistic cloud field that looks a lot like that picture of the South China Sea that I showed you before. 
So in general, it's representing all of the fluid flows that generate these kinds of clouds. Uh, this next figure is from the Japanese Nikam global cloud resolving model. So this model is now being used for a decade, more than a decade, to uh, simulate the atmosphere without use of a cumulus parameterization uh, at grid resolutions anywhere from 14 kilometers, which really isn't adequate for that purpose, um, all the way down to less than one kilometer globally, um, of which resolution the model can only be run for a few days. But uh, at sub one kilometer resolution, this is an enormous computational achievement. Um, and this picture just shows views all the way from the global view in the top to zooms in on smaller and smaller uh, regions of the atmosphere. So that the picture on the right is in fact, the model output shown at one kilometer resolution where you can see individual cumulus clouds rising from the ocean into the upper troposphere. So the question is, can simulations like this help subgrid parameterizations? So the points here are these cloud resolving models, or I'll call them CRMs, are actually advancing faster than the moist physics parameterizations in global climate models, because they're easier to develop. Uh, and the reason they're easier to develop is that in a cloud resolving model, the cloud properties and air velocities are largely resolved. They don't vary much within a grid cell. And that means that you need to parameterize physical processes, such as uh, liquid and ice microphysics, aerosols, very small scale turbulence, but you don't need to, you, you don't need the complexity of a climate model, which has to parameterize all of the variability of clouds within a grid cell. In particular, if you use resolutions, horizontal grid resolutions less than about five kilometers for cumulonimbus clouds and less than about 250 meters for boundary layer, shallow clouds, I, those models seem to work well enough to provide realistic reference data sets for parameterizing cloud processes in climate models. But the problem, and so in fact, we have a program called, uh, was originally called GCSS, and now it's called GAS, the Global Atmospheric System Study, which uh, uses this approach of trying to use high resolution process models as a bridge between observations and parameterizations. And that's led at places like ECMWF or NCAR or MPI to much better parameterizations of, of cumulus convection and boundary layer clouds. But progress has been slow because in the end, uh, the human in the middle of this picture is a bottleneck because we can't take in the complicated information in these simulations and turn it into parameterizations. Or it's hard to do that. There are very few people who are trained to do that. So that suggests, again, that we should use machine learning for this prob uh, problem. And in particular now uh, is the time for that because we have increasingly large and comprehensive training data from both high resolution observations and high resolution cloud resolving model simulations. And this is what I would call a coarse graining problem because uh, what we want to do is we want to take results from a, a model with a very fine grid. We want to then use that to inform how to make parameterizations on a model with a much coarser grid. Basically, the idea is to average the behavior of the fine grid model to the coarse grid, and then see if that behavior can be predicted from variables that the coarse grid model uh, evolves forward, such as temperature and humidity and wind profiles. Um, and in fact, the, we know, for instance, for cumulus convection, that the coarse grid average profiles don't entirely determine what the cloud field is inside that. So this parameterization should be stochastic. 
there's, there, there will be a, a range of internal fine grid variability, which is consistent with the same coarse grid profiles. And our fine grid simulation can actually inform us about that stochastic variability as well. So, um, so anyhow, so now I want to show you our, the application that Noah Brenowitz, my postdoc, has been working on uh, with me. Uh, so I first want to show you our training data set. So our training data set consists of three hourly, three-dimensional snapshots from a very large cloud resolving model simulation called a near global aqua planet simulation. Um, this was chosen partly because we had this and partly because I think it has a good level of complexity for, for doing this. So here the sea surface temperature is maximum in the middle of the domain in a horizontal stripe in the middle of the domain along the equator. The domain runs from 46 degrees south, 10,000 kilometers up to 46 degrees north at the top, uh, where the sea surface temperature is much colder. And the east-west dimension is 20,000 kilometers. The simulation is four, has four kilometer resolution and 34 vertical levels. And uh, there are 80 days of data that we have from this. So that's 640 snapshots. And I'll just show you a short movie of, of what this simulation does. So basically it's simulating, um, again, a tropical convective belt in the center with many, many scales of variability. Uh, it's simulating uh, storm tracks toward at the north and south boundary. Uh, in the middle regions, the subtropics, there's a lot of uh, low-lying cloud and frontal systems. So you see that there's the full degree of multi-scale complexity that you see in the real atmosphere. In fact, this whole simulation looks sufficiently realistic um, that it's hard to tell from the real atmosphere, from a satellite picture of the real atmosphere. So what do we do with this? Well, what we do is we take this simulation and for each three hour chunk, we coarse grain the four kilometer resolution data to 160 kilometer boxes. So 160 kilometers will be the resolution which you can think of as being our target global climate model. We chose 160 kilometer resolution because the decorrelation time of precipitation over 160 kilometer boxes is about six hours, which is bigger than the three hour sampling time. So if we use too small a coarse grain box, we actually wouldn't be able to resolve the variability within that box in time, but here we can. So then what we do is we take each, so we take, in this case, just the tropics of the simulation, we divide it into 160 by 160 kilometer boxes, and then we average over those boxes and we get the picture at the lower right. And then within each of those 160 by 160 kilometer coarse boxes, uh, we calculate the temperature and moisture profiles, and we use those as inputs for our machine learning scheme after we uh, pre-process them by centering them, scaling them, and putting them all in the same vector. And so basically, we have something like 68 inputs uh, from these two profiles, each of which has 34 vertical levels. And we have a couple of auxiliary inputs as well, uh, namely the surface sensible and latent heat fluxes, the top of atmosphere radiation. And uh, what in particular we're trying to predict with these is the so-called apparent heating and apparent drying in the column. So the idea here is that there is a coarse grained velocity, which is advecting the temperature variable. Here it's called liquidized static energy and the moisture variable, which in this case includes condensate. Um, that coarse grained velocity is advecting these quantities around, but then the physics of the model uh, the say the con convection and the clouds are acting to remove water, for instance, by precipitation, uh, which causes latent heating. So they're acting to heat and they're acting to moisten or dry, in this case, the, the atmosphere uh, at each grid point. 
and we want to predict in each column what the profiles, vertical profiles of heating and drying are, Q1 and Q2. And we use for this purpose a neural net, in this case, a single layer neural net with about 70,000 parameters, 256 nodes. So we have about 1.3 million samples, coarse grain grid columns from the simulation. So 70,000 parameters and 1.3 million grid columns still doesn't cause the model to be too underfit to the data or too overfit to the data. And when we do this, uh, we, it turns out, yes, we can predict the Q1 and Q2 very well. So this is a time series of um, over 30 days of the simulation of what the model predicts Q1, which is the heating rate. Think of this as the latent heating rate, but it also adds radiation as well, radiative cooling, is as a function of height within the model on the top and as predicted by the neural net on the bottom. And the neural net is being fed, or the simulation is being fed the, uh, the time series of temperature and moisture profiles that the model sees. So the, the here, in this case, neural net is getting the same inputs as the model. And so uh, you can see it's representing the heating profile quite well. But now if you couple this to uh, a single column model in which uh, you also apply advective tendencies from the vertical and the horizontal winds in a given grid column, the method blows up in a day. It's not actually stable. Uh, and you, in fact, have to enforce that the model produces, um, is accurate over multiple time steps, not just a single time step, in order to prevent it from blowing up. And then that selects a model which is basically almost as accurate as the original model, but then is also stable if you do that. OK, and so once you do this, then uh, you end up with much better single column model performance. So in this case, the top is a time series over 80 days of what the original simulation did. The middle is the neural network run in a single column mode. And this is at one grid point somewhere on the equator. And blue here indicates, um, uh, I think, uh, negative humidity anomalies and red or positive. I can't actually see the scale. Uh, you, you probably can, but you can see the time series match almost perfectly, while another single column model from the NCARS community atmosphere model um, doesn't do nearly as well when forced the same way. Okay, so lastly, I just want to show you some testing in a full three-dimensional setting. So now, we're going out of a single column model. We're just using this as the only parameterization of all physics processes in our global model. And so now we're running our original cloud resolving model, but instead of running it at four kilometer resolution, we're running it at 160 kilometer by 160 kilometer resolution with this neural net, or with a variation on this neural net parameterization as it's moist physics parameterization. So it's doing clouds, it's doing radiation, it's doing everything. Uh, we initialize it from a snapshot of the original NG Aqua model at some particular time. Uh, we run our, our course resolution model forward and then we see how well it matches the original model. And this doesn't show how well the course grid model matches the original model, but it shows six time slices of the precipitable water field from the course resolution model. So yellow colors here indicate wet regions, uh, so the ITCZ in the middle, and then you can see frontal regions um, in the subtropics very well as well. And what you can see that the real near global aquaplanet simulation looks like the picture at the upper left. Um, and uh, that has the same statistical character at all times. So all of the pictures here, the, these 10, these time slices over 10 days uh, should uh, look like the picture at upper left. And you can see that they, they, they kind of do, they don't, things don't blow up, but they become increasingly zonal with time. So the ITCZ tends to collapse onto the equator uh, after 10 days to some extent. This is actually due to some small systematic errors in the neural net, which caused the difference between precipitation and evaporation 
to drift a little bit, and uh, we're still getting rid of those right now. But the 10-day forecast is stable, so it can be run as a parameterization, and it works pretty well. For instance, if you look after one day at the P minus E, we don't actually individually predict precipitation and evaporation. We only predict their difference uh, in this model. Uh, you can see on the left the original simulation, and on the right is the coarse grain simulation with our parameterization, the neural net, as the moist physics parameterization. They match very well in terms of where the precipitation is. The red spots are the same and the blue spots are the same, but you can see that the observations or the original data set has a lot more small scale variability, which the neural net ends up smoothing out. So in particular for ensemble prediction, it would be nice to put back some of that small scale precipitation variability, um, which would require a developing a stochastic version of this neural net parameterization. So those are some ongoing challenges that we have. We still have some drift of our parameterization. We would like to make it stochastic. Uh, but overall, I would say um, within the course of a year, we have developed a parameterization of the entire moist physics of an atmospheric model, uh, which works pretty well. Um, you know, it's not, it's, I think, would be somewhat competitive with parameterizations that we have now for some applications already. And, uh, you know, we're only one group, and there are a lot of other people working on this now, too. And so I have little doubt that, um, uh, that, that we're going to succeed uh, in making machine learning into an important part of parameterization. So as a final prospectus, then, uh, as observations and model data sets get so big that humans are not well equipped to get the most out of them, Machine learning is becoming an important tool for making models better. Um, it is possible to design a machine learning scheme that works well in a hybrid context, i.e. when put together with a numerical flow solver that's based on normal numerical analysis approaches. Um, but it requires some expert human de uh, design in order to make it work. It doesn't just work automatically. There are several research groups making rapid progress in areas of machine learning parameterization uh, that people are looking at don't just include atmospheric convection, but they also include ocean eddy mixing, land surface processes, sea ice, etc. Um, and my prediction is that there will be a machine learning parameterization in the operational version of a numerical weather prediction or climate model some, somewhere within three years. I think this will progress very rapidly, uh, especially for present day uh, weather and climate variability where it's possible to train the model more easily um, using present day observations or using models that are well constrained by present day observations. So thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Chris, for this uh, interesting talk. I received some um, some questions. The first one is uh, from uh, Hamad Madavi from Iran. His question is, uh, is this system already in use in any country and how they can get it? <laughs> well, so far, <laughs> these are research systems. They aren't operational systems. And so, no, uh, it's not available in any country, and no, you wouldn't want to use it right now, even if you could. So, uh, so as I said, uh, wait, wait three years. Uh, uh, probably, probably, I imagine ECMWF is going to be the first place that can use a system like this. But uh, uh, anyhow, uh, stay tuned. Okay. So Hamad is also asking if uh, uh, these weather data can be used together with other big agricultural data. Yeah, so this, again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make parameterizations that fit within weather forecast models. We're not trying to make complete prediction systems. So the question is, you know, to the extent that you can use the output of a numerical weather prediction model to help agricultural forecasts, for instance, by better predicting uh, precipitation, 
uh, then of course this can help. Um, but it's it's not it's not a self-standing system. It's part of a numerical weather prediction model. Okay, so there is a, a Jennifer Lanier. She said, "Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> Very interesting. Finger crossed. The models will more accurately predict such a complete complex issue weather." And so she uh, was unable to stay for all the presentation. Then there is another question from uh, Deeps Kumar Jain. The question is, how does the neural net train the or for uh, organized MCS where the traveling MCS can change the precipitation in matter of minutes to hours and where wind shear plays a major role? Uh, yeah, so all of these are good questions. So um, I, I think I'll go back to this precipitation plot from the previous page. So, because this shows, you know, what a neural net in this case can and can't do. So the first thing about any machine learning parameterization is you have to choose what its inputs and outputs are. Now, to some extent with deep learning schemes, it can, you can use everything you can think of and hopefully the scheme can actually decide what it thinks are the important inputs and outputs. But uh, in general, it helps to decide or limit what the inputs and outputs of your scheme are. So in particular, in our scheme right now, we're not using wind shear as an input. So we're not using the vertical wind profile. We actually, uh, we're actually experimenting with that right now, but here we don't. So in particular, then wind shear cannot influence how the model predicts uh, the convective heating and moistening profiles will look like. Now, something like an organized mesoscale convective system can actually occupy a number of grid cells of a, of a weather prediction model. But with our resolution, 160 by 160 kilometers for our course resolution model, it really can't resolve MCSs either. So they are a little bit stuck between the cracks of this application. Uh, but um, that said, I would say this kind of training data set does include organized mesoscale convective systems in the four kilometer model. And we could learn how to, uh, how to parameterize them better using say a 40 kilometer grid where the, it would only be the finer scale features that we would be trying to parameterize. And the course scale organization of the MCS would be explicitly simulated. That's okay. sort of how I think the problem should be done. Okay, there is another question from Casper uh, Inz. The question is, was the NG Aqua snapshot uh, used to initialize the 160 kilometer simulation also included in the training data? Did you in any way make sure this snap snapshot was not outside the domain of the parameterization? Uh, okay, well, those are both good machine learning questions. I think for the purpose of uh, this, yes, the original uh, snapshot was a part of the training data set in this case, although I don't think that's at all relevant to the performance. Uh, I understand the question. Um, in fact, though, the the way the model is trained, you have to calculate the apparent heating and moistening from the difference of two snapshots. So no one individual snapshot is really all that relevant. It's the evolution of snapshots. And so from that point of view, the one initial condition doesn't somehow bias our okay. machine learning scheme. Uh, and then in terms of the other question, um, uh, let's see, what was, can you can you repeat that, Giovanni? The second part so of the question. The question is, did you in any way make sure this snapshot was not outside the domain of the parameterization? Oh yeah. So no, we right now we do not have anything that. Um, well, so we don't have any test saying if you're outside of the training range that the model will somehow say error. Uh, mm -hmm. It. It, it just might blow up right now. Uh, partly that's because in this very complicated 68 dimensional space, it's very hard for, that, we, that we're using for the machine learning parameterization uh, predictions. Uh, it's hard to decide when is data actually outside of its training range. So that's sort of a good research question looking forward is how to decide 
when the mo when the machine learning scheme should not be used. So there is Arturo Quintanar. He says, uh, I wonder how this strategy with neural network can be hybridized with super parametrization a la David Randall in Tali. Uh, yeah, OK. So, um, so in fact, the Rasp et al. paper that I told you about, Stefan Rasp and Mike Pritchard and Pierre Gentin published a very nice paper where basically they're using machine learning to emulate superparameterization. So they basically, uh, superparameterization is an approach where you use a cloud resolving model in each grid column of a climate model. And they had a very large or very long uh, run of a superparameterized simulation, again, of an aqua planet that they then turned into a, a simulation of what that superparameterization did in terms of predicting the moist convection, and it worked very well. So uh, this works, this can work very well as, uh, as a substitute for having to run a full superparameterization. You train the machine learning scheme on the superparameterization and run that instead. So we have a lot of questions, Chris. So there is a Tino Manzato, is asking, is it possible to apply the same approach of simulating subgrid parametrization of climate model also to high resolution one kilometers LAM model, for example, assimilating with neural network what is explicitly resolved in a 50 meter LES? Uh, yeah, I think it's entirely possible to do that. And the big caveat is it takes a lot of, of fine resolution data and that fine resolution uh, model output, the very the 50 meter output has to cover all of the cases that you are going to need uh, to uh, learn about the subgrid behavior of the one kilometer model. Mm -hmm. So you have to have an adequate training data set to cover all of your cases. And, and you know, so you have to have a strategy for how you're going to generate that. Andrea Bertini says, uh, when you talk about machine learning, are you including deep learning? Uh, yeah, so the network I showed was a one layer network. Um, the network, the Raspidal paper used a nine layer network, which is considered to be a neural net, which is considered to be deep learning. And in fact, the results I was showing for the full near global aqua planet three-dimensional case we're using i think a four-layer neural net so that's also getting toward deep learning uh, so deep learning is normally considered to be where you have a neural net that has met doesn't just have one layer of neurons but it has multiple layers of neurons and so uh, uh, it can sort of start to internally recognize features in your data set rather than you telling it what's important in the data set. So, Je Thanks. So Jennifer Way is asking something that I will uh, answer uh, later because she is asking is, if this presentation will be posted somewhere. I will uh, say something at the end. Uh, Matteo San Giorgio uh, is asking which is the complexity of the neural net you used? Number of, yeah. number yeah. of video layers, number of neurons per layer, so on. Okay, yeah, so I just addressed that question, uh, the 128 neurons, and uh, there's different number of layers depending on the different applications. The tropical application, there was one layer, and the full domain NG aqua that included tropics and mid-latitude is a four-layer neural net. And I have put up right now, I think, the uh, location which you can go to for the uh, webinar recording, the YouTube. Okay, so, can everyone see that? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so you can you can write that down if you're interested. Yeah. Okay, so Mark Coverley uh, is asking, do you see this being of significant benefit in forecasting squalls in West Africa where weather radar are steadily lacking? Uh, well, potentially. I think in general the question is, uh, can you make a better cumulus parameterization from this? Uh, or alternatively, could I make better simulations even at one or three kilometers uh, using a weather forecasting model um, based on the limited information that we have, say, over the, over the Sahara? And uh, yes, um, but I, I should say that, for instance, we, we have regional models that try to forecast 
um, West African squall lines uh, using higher resolution models already, you know, using four kilometer or three kilometer resolution models already. So uh, our machine learning scheme would have to add value to that model, which already resolves the cumulus conduction. Okay, Tim Palmer has a question that is similar to the question I have you, uh, for you. So um, my question was, uh, I, I mean, uh, if uh, these approximations uh, uh, are fast enough to uh, significantly accelerate calculation of model physics and chemistry, and Tim is asking, you didn't talk about whether this uh, artificial intelligence based parametrization will significantly speed up the computations, any thoughts? Uh, well, they're hugely faster than uh, running the original parameterizations uh, for SAM. I mean, for instance, our, our neural net is faster than running the radiation scheme in, in our SAM model alone. Do um, you have some numbers just to say uh, the percentage? Uh, well, so ironically, we haven't worried too much about that because um, because we're using a model, a cloud resolving model that was not really originally designed for 160 by 160 kilometer grids. We have to run our, our 160 by 160 kilometer simulations at, at something like um, uh, one minute resolution, which means that all, all of our effort is spent on ejecting things around. The neural net takes none of the effort whatsoever right now. So, I mean, in some sense, the answer to what Tim is saying is, is uh, if you make your neural net very efficient, you end up spending all of your time uh, on the advection scheme anyhow. So uh, the neural net is definitely efficient enough that that becomes the trade-off you're probably going to make. Okay. There is another. We have a lot of questions. I don't know if we can uh, uh, answer to all these questions. Anyway, Taira is asking, have uh, there been comparison done for this model to other models? And what are the unique opportunities this model offers that others don't? Don't. <clears throat> well, again, it's very early days, so we are not really in the business of comparing this to other uh, cumulus parameterizations yet. I did show you a single column comparison of our approach to the single column version of the community atmosphere model, which is a full physics conventional climate model with parameterizations of cumulus convection, microphysics, et cetera. And our approach for that case worked a lot better, but I should say that the approach was being trained on the same data set, different, you know, and not the same data set, but a, a similar data set to the one that I showed the comparison on and the single column version of CAM was not. So I think it was a bit of an unfair comparison. Uh, we should have been able to do better. Um, okay. But in future, I think it's the case that obviously uh, we'll have to do those comparisons. Fiat Samed is asking, how are you imposing energy conservation in the neural network output? Uh, um, in the sense that is the predicted Q1 consistent with conserve an MSA budget? Uh, MSA. Yeah, so we actually check energy conservation. We can check uh, basically moist static energy conservation. It's a little bit. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's interesting when you parameterize the entire moist physics using just these heating and moistening profiles, things that you think would be normal energy conservation constraints really aren't because, for instance, if you lose energy from a column uh, or gain energy from a column, it's through a difference of radiation and uh, surface fluxes. You don't actually predict the surface fluxes or the radiative cooling profile or the top of atmosphere radiative fluxes uh, explicitly. All you do is predict their difference. So uh, actually, it turns out that things like energy conservation are a bit harder to test than you might think. But be that as it may, we believe, for instance, uh, um, our scheme approximately conserves energy quite well. Uh, and we can make it exactly conserve energy if we want. Uh, at some, there's, there's some trade-off to how, how stable it is, though, if we do that. Okay, there is a, another question from Steven Rasp. How do you imagine tuning the machine learning parameterization after the training process could work? 
most likely there will be systematic errors once the neural network is implemented prognostically. Okay, well, <laughs> I would hate to take a question from Stefan about this since he knows probably twice as much about it as I do. So I'll, I'll reflect that question back to him. I actually, uh, we actually have a different approach to machine learning that's based on using reanalysis that takes care of some of those issues. Sì. But it's completely sì. different than that. Devo chiudere comunque, no? Ok. I don't know if we can proceed with this uh, uh, lot of questions. Malcolm Mystery is asking, uh, um, no, uh, let me see. Is Malcolm Mystery, yes. I was wondering if you use any clustering al algorithm before running your actual neural network algorithm. The clustering algorithm could perhaps help in stratifying the full spatial domain into subsets of zones with similar properties, then thus reducing potential bias in the current full domain neural model. All right. So this is a this is a very good question. Uh, so as you may have noticed, we actually started by just making a parameterization for the tropical belt of this model, exactly to deal with this issue that we wanted to just simulate an individual climate regime. Uh, then we actually tried um, having different neural nets for different latitude belts. So that's a very simple form of clustering uh, here. Uh, it's not a machine learning type clustering approach. But then the problem is how do you put those neural nets together? And we found that it was actually easier or better to design a single neural net that would cover the entire range of cloud regimes that we had. Uh, so that's what we ended up doing. Now, the other question, though, is, is there some way of doing some dimension reduction to reduce the number of features that we're using um, to not use all 34 different levels of the model? And there, I think uh, there's, again, a, a lot of potential for using uh, more parsimonious representations of the data and reducing the number of features. And again, some people on this phone call know uh, much more about this than I do. So uh, I think uh, stay tuned for progress on that. Okay, Chris, I think that uh, uh, there are uh, 12, uh, 12 more questions, but we don't have time. That's uh, justify the interest that your talk <laughs> uh, had. Uh, before ending the session, uh, I would like to remind you that uh, this webinar will be recorded and published at this site, and we will, we will, will be also promoted uh, through the CMCC website. And if you go to the last slide, Chris, please, because there is the next. Uh, I webinar. think I'm on the last slide. No, no, before. Oh, before. no, no. Okay, yeah, you, I got it. Uh, the forthcoming webinar on low carbon uh, will be held on November 27 and will be given by Tobias Schmidt and Jan Steffen from the Energy Politics Group, ETH Zurich. And the moderator of the webinar will be Elena Berdolini, senior researcher at uh, the European Institute on Economics and Economics and Environment in Milan. So I would like to thank everybody, especially you, Chris, for the, for the interesting talk. And uh, as you can see, this argument is very, very um, topic uh, uh, and challenging. So I think that in the future we can have more opportunities to share our uh, impression and the uh, scientific results on machine learning for climate. Okay, so thank you to everybody and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye, Chris. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye. Thanks for listening. Bye.